Planning and Development, uh, and CFO for Grupo Van Vanguardia, a privately owned media real estate development and lodging group in northern Mexico. Um, you have his full uh, bio in front of you, but uh, Enrique, it's great to have you with us. Thank you very much for, for um, taking the time to come up and, and be with us. And, and secondly, we have a new friend uh, of mine. We met uh, a week and a half ago in Mexico City, um, Merlin Cochran, um, uh, as he's known in Mexico, Merlin El Mago. Um, and as a Brit, I'm just delighted to meet any Mexican who has that name. So um, he is the general director of OMEXI, which is the Mexican Association of Companies in the Hydrocarbons Industry. Um, prior to that, Merlin worked at, uh, at Cener, where he was the deputy general director in the oil and gas upstream division. There he worked on promoting local content, developing public policies regarding the environmental aspects of the upstream sector, uh, such as emissions reduction, managing the ministry's upstream data warehouses, amongst others. Um, Merlin also has a, a background, of course, in the private sector. He's worked with companies such as uh, Schlumberger um, and uh, has, uh, has worked with companies as diverse as Shell, BP, uh, ENI, uh, Exxon, etc. So welcome, Merlin. We're, great to, uh, we're very grateful that you've taken the time to be with us. And we know that uh, this will be the, uh, the first of many times that you'll be up at the Wilson Center because Correct. we'll drag you back. Okay. Thank you um, for having me. In terms of opening statements, I'd like to, uh, to begin with you, uh, Merlin. And, uh, you know, I'd like to, uh, to ask you if you could talk to us, sort of how do you see this current, uh, you know, juncture uh, in, 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 in Mexican history, this moment where we're seeing uh, turbulence, uh, uncertainty, and as a, uh, you know, the, the head of a, an important industry organization, how do you navigate that? Yeah, thank you. Uh, first of all, Duncan, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me. Thank you for inviting Amexi. I know Amexi has been a partner for quite a while. And just to go into your question, um, actually, th there's currently a discussion of the National Development Plan uh, within Mexico. For those of you that don't know about this, the National Development Plan, uh, it's a plan that it's by law, that it... Uh, kind of states the path of investment uh, for the country for the following six years. Uh, so we are currently talking with the administration about what do we believe are key uh, in terms of developing within our sector the upstream side of things. No? So specifically, how, how do we navigate this? Uh, of course, there's uncertainty uh, currently, but we are um, as part, uh, uh, as a diverse group of uh, companies committed towards the long term. No, the contracts that were signed are signed uh, for 30 to 40 years. Uh, of course, Dr. Moreira, I'm sure he's still around, uh, mentioned about the, um, the life of those contracts. And it's, uh, of course, we need to ensure that uh, people understand that it takes time to mature, know that we can produce uh, first oil uh, the day after the contracts are signed. Most of the contracts today, they have um, an average life of 1.5 years. And as, as hard as the people are working towards getting uh, oil production uh, ASAP, it will take time. Now, the first thing that we're trying to say when we talk with the government is uh, we are your partners. We're not your partners because uh, you know we. It, it's uh, something nice to have to be. We're contractually your partners. Our uh, production is Mexico's production. Se north of seventy percent of the royalties go to the state. No, so we we need to change a little bit that paradigm where we're counterparts or we are the other uh, people who are there to extract and not leave nothing behind. On the country, uh, Mexico's growth, Mexico's production growth is uh, linked to our growth, and our growth is also linked to Mexico's growth. No, and we're here for the long term as well. So that's the first thing w we tell the government. No, we we, we try to uh, kind of change that uh, paradigm and then talk into uh, what we believe are the best steps toward the national plan. Um, I guess I'll answer that question. If you want me to go more into the uh, detail of the development plan of what we believe are, are the key steps, I'm happy to do that as well. Let's come back to that, and I'll, I'll turn the microphone over to Enrique. And uh, you know, as the as the head of a of a power company in Mexico, um, having seen the exciting uh, sort of explosive growth that that has experienced over the uh, over the last few years, and now that we're in this moment of pause, 
Is that how it works out for you guys as well? Or is it actually that you continue to engage, you continue to do business? Um, where, where are we in the electricity and power generation cycle at, at this point in time? Well, first of all, thank you for the invite and for your kind words. Uh, I think we're going to have to relearn what we learned 11 years ago with this new cycle in Mexico. And thank you already for, for staying awake. You know, the time after lunch is typically the harder, harder one to stay awake. Um, the, um, the, the way I would answer or, or uh, attempt to answer your question, Duncan, is um, you know, picture yourself as driving on you know, California Highway number 1. You know, it's a nice drive. You know, it's 70 degrees. Your rooftop is off. You're driving there, you know, just picture that there. And uh, that's where you're gonna get your reward, you know, either your nice glass of Pinot or, or, your, or your nice uh, glass of, of, of Chardonnay. You're driving there and uh, you've done that drive always. You know, every day you've done the drive and it's, it's, it's taking you there. Uh, and suddenly you hit fog, you know, one of those proverbial and, and well-known California fogs. And the fog is dense. And you're driving at 70, you need to get there because your wine is not going to wait for you. And, um, and the fog is dense. And then everybody starts slowing down. People start making U-turns because you turn on the radio and the weather channel and you can't hear what the radio channel is broadcasting. Or the information is not necessarily what you need, need, need to hear to continue your journey. And uh, so what do you do? Do you stop? Uh, do you keep going? Do you trust your instincts and, and drive on the fog? Your car is well equipped, you know, and you have a fuel, um, a full tank of fuel, right? And uh, then suddenly you stop, you take an exit ramp, and then there's a, you know, cars there, you know, arguing and making conjectures on what's going on, and why this fog hit, and why the weather channel is not giving you the right information, and why people are making U-turns, and it starts making you wonder, you know, do you do you continue your journey? Or do you stop? Or do you go slower? Do you go faster? Right? You don't want to miss out on that Pinot, right? You you, you really want that wine. So um, so anyway, that that's the way I, I see that, the, that that's happening right now in Mexico. It's a foggy trail. It's it's dense. There's not a lot of information. Uh, there was a major shakeout on the you know 30 years of or so of uh, how government was made in Mexico. The, uh, the, particularly the last six years, the, uh, in, in the energy sector at least, the, uh, the government reached out. You know, how many times did you have government officials visiting here at the Wilson Center, the, either undersecretaries, the secretaries themselves, directors of area, and the Wilson Center, and all the other you know, think tanks here in D.C., you know, in, in San Diego, how many, how many did you have, Jeremy, down there? Well, that seems to have stopped. You know, you know, as per your words earlier, you know, Alberto Montoya was going to be here, and then he canceled. And uh, so, what what's happening really in Mexico? My explanation is there's there's this. Let's let's pause, even for the government. No, it's it's foggy. No, they don't know what they're. They probably don't know what they don't know. Right now, they think they know, but they probably don't know what they don't know. So they're they're afraid of maybe committing to certain things because they don't have enough information. They uh, the circles of trust were shaking up. So in the past, there were friends of the government that the government trusted, that the markets here in the U.S. trusted, that the organizations here in the U.S. trusted. Those people are gone, or, or they've basically taken a very low profile. And uh, so the question is, how do you, how do you get that, that weather channel information back so that you can make decisions so that you can continue driving? In the case of electricity in Mexico, uh, you have a new head of CFE. You know, it's a it's a, an old wolf, you know, a very, very weathered uh, individual that uh, you know amongst his accolades. You know, he he was the governor of Puebla and he was the head of the system that apparently crashed that gave the presidency to uh, to Carlos Salinas, and that's just maybe a, a myth. But, uh, but anyway, so, so the man is weathered, and, and he's he he knows what he's doing. He might not understand about electricity, but he knows what he's doing. <laughs> They have uh, the head of uh, Senase. It's also a, a person that, after he retired, has uh, enjoyed 35 years of uh, professional experience. So that tells you how, how experienced the head of Senase is. Uh, he does know about systems. But between them, you know, they're really conducting the, uh, the uh, electricity you know, policymaking machine in Mexico. Uh, up until maybe a couple of weeks ago, they named an undersecretary of electricity. And before then, there was no, 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 no such person. And um, so this, that the, 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 again, the fog, the path is foggy, the information is not there, 
the circles of trust have been broken or, or the circles of trust are, have yet to be rebuilt. So the, what we have to, and what we're doing, now to answer now your question, is what we're doing is basically driving slowly, you know, going there, gathering information, uh, identifying who are the, you know, the interlocutors, the, the middlemen, basically, the bards, for lack of a better word, that will tell the story to the government, and in this case, the uh, energy, the energy officials, of how things could, could and should continue moving forward. Uh, as a company, we've actually doubled down. You know, we've we've gone more to Mexico in the last three months than we've we've done in the last year. Uh, we just signed an agreement in Mexico to uh, uh, develop uh, wind and solar and energy infrastructure. Uh, so we're taking development risk, basically, in a country where everybody's turning around, making a U-turn. <laughs> we're, 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 you know, uh, holding st uh, steady on our path, and um, but we we're uh, avid and ravenous for uh, information, and that information is not being, uh, it's not a commodity right now. It's actually very scarce. Uh, it's very very scarce uh, uh, resource, and uh, and it, it's shared. No, it's shared by by people in the industry as well. Uh, so the lack of, of availability uh, of the Secretary of Energy, of uh, Mr. Bartlett himself, of other people, now it's, it's, uh, it's creating voids, and people are filling those voids with myths. Now there, there's the myths of why did they cancel the, the subasta, right? Why did, they, uh, why did they cancel the DC lines? You know? And then there, those, some of that are myths. Some of them, are, they, they might have some truth in it, but I think there's a lot of myths going around. So we need to steer, you know, I want to steer clear of, of, of falling into the myth trap and, and then repeating something that we don't have enough information to uh, basically uh, assess if, if that's indeed what happened. Um, so we're doubling down. We have plenty of confidence in Mexico. We're patient. You no, know, I, I think uh, patience uh, should, should be shared. Capital sometimes is not patient, so that, that's, that creates a conflict. But... Uh, but I think in the, at least in the, in the next six months or maybe a year, patience is going to be something that, that, uh, that, will, that will have to be exerted so that uh, you know, we understand further what's going on down there. Did I answer your question? I, that, that, was a, that was a great answer. And uh, in particular, I, um, I think the contrast between what you're going through right now and where you were, let's say, a year ago, where there was a constant flow of information, where the energy minister was available, where the undersecretaries were available. They were out there not just selling the idea of the reform, but giving us regular updates about how things were going and the publication of enormous amounts of information that were coming out of the various regulatory agencies, etc. All of that, so I guess it lulled us into a false sense of security that this, was, this is now normal, mm -hmm. whereas what we're experiencing right now may be closer to what the old system was and that we had got used to all those years ago. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I want to turn to, um, uh, to you, Merlin, and, and I want to pick up on this idea of, the, uh, of, of information flows. As an industry organization, um, and, and this is your opportunity to tell me about your business plan going ahead as well, but, but how do you gather that information? How do you share that with your members? Um, because it, it is a very challenging environment right now. It certainly is. Um, so our main counterpart for information today, uh, and it has been as well uh, throughout the start of the uh, energy reform, has been CNH. They do have uh, what is called the information center, and I, I must say that they're doing a tremendous job in, in terms of publishing data. And what we do uh, through Amexi is we, we follow their lead, basically. You know? um, so what the, the main metrics today, which are production, uh, in terms of forecasts as well, uh, in terms of investment, uh, we take those. We want to have the same metrics as they do. We don't have. We don't want to have uh, two different channels of information when, where there's a, a gap in, in between. Um, but then the biggest uh, part of this, uh, uh, the main challenge, I guess, is not only uh, having that uh, data. It's what you do with it. How do you communicate it? Uh, who do you approach with it? No. And that, I must say, is the biggest challenge we have today. And it goes back to exactly what you were saying in terms of the flow of information. Uh, it before, uh, with the ministry, uh, th there was the same ideals. Uh, the information flew constantly. Today, uh, trying to uh, send the message across that what it's currently stated within CNH 
is uh, something that we are part of, uh, for example, just production, it takes time you know, for that message to be delivered. And the biggest, uh, it's, on, it's not only uh, Sener, but it's, it's also the energy reform itself. In, in the sense that, uh, and the previous panels have talked about this, I, I won't go into that, but uh, it, it was, um, the bar was stated quite high, you know. Uh, the goal of having three million barrels per day uh, was never achieved. Uh, and of course, the thing here is it's, uh, it, everybody talks about the three millions, but they don't talk about the assumptions when this was done, you know. So today, when we have the conversation with the president, we've had it uh, twice already where, uh, with the new administration, the idea is to show results every six months, uh, specifically for the trade organizations that are working the upstream side to meet the president and say, okay, these are the metrics, uh, this is what you ask us to do. We are also doubling down. No? Um, so yeah, that's uh, we, we want to have the all of the stakeholders uh, know what that means, how it relates to them uh, without raising the bar too high. No? And just on that point, I mean, the, the president has been quite clear that he wants to see these results, right? Yeah. He wants to see investment picking up. Is that what the industry is delivering at this point in time? Because, you know, the president saying you should invest more now yeah. is one thing. But if you're uncertain about how this whole thing is going to turn out, would you really be that enthusiastic about putting more of your money on the line? Enrique has just said, yes, they're doubling down yeah. on the power side. How is the industry, the oil industry, reacting? There's different sorts of profiles. There are people who are back to the contract uh, obliged. They have minimum work commitments. That means that they need to drill exploratory wells. Uh, that was actually part of the bid. They either had to do one or two, it depends. Uh, there's different life stages for the contract as well. If, if uh, the exploration was uh, successful, they'll go into development and whatnot. So it depends on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, what I can say is that none of them are, are pulling out. I mean, they might be cashing out, uh, such as uh, Sierra, for example, but that doesn't necessarily mean that uh, at the end of the day, uh, what the president wants, which is production, there's no interference with that goal, no? Uh, so it very much d it depends. And we, in Amexi, do represent uh, different stakeholders, uh, people with different risk appetites, deep water, uh, onshore, shallow, you name it. No, it's, all, it's on a case-by-case -case basis. Okay, great. Um, going back to you, uh, Enrique, where do you see the biggest growth um, in, the, in, uh, in demand for power coming from in the Mexican uh, system? Is it, is it from industrial? Is it from residential? Is it, uh, um, you know, it's, and, and l building upon that, if we think about where the Mexican economy appears to be going right now, um, how does that change those expectations? It's funny, funny you ask this question because uh, I had a conversation last week with uh, another fellow uh, power company executive, and uh, he was sharing, you know, he's based in Mexico, so he has more access to information than I do. Uh, he was sharing that uh, demand growth in, in some regions in Mexico is expected to be 5% uh, or, or larger. So 5%, if, if you had an investor-owned utility here in the U.S. that had 5% growth, go and buy the stock mm -hmm. <laughs> because, you, you, you know, that's, that's, that's a lot of growth. Now, you see areas here in the New Mexico, for instance, has negative growth uh, in demand. Uh, some areas in Texas, uh, putting aside Texas because of, the, uh, of the dr all the drilling, the Permian, and, and all that. So Mexico has 5% growth, and Banco de Mexico came out with a uh, revised growth, uh, you know, uh, G uh, GDP growth of one point, let's say, let's call it 5%. So you have 1.5% growth mm -hmm. in the economy, but 5% growth yeah. in demand. So where, how, how come? You know, how come is that, is that happening? And, and uh, this per I asked that question to this person, and he said, well, it's not, it's not in tandem. It's not completely uh, correlated. No, the, the growth in the economy versus the growth in demand, and it comes mostly from, uh, you know, residential. You no, know, uh, cities are growing. Yeah. You no, know, people don't live with their folks anymore, so they want an apartment. They want a small home. They want. Uh, people are consuming more. They have more more gadgets. They have more more electrical consumption. Overall, there's more uh, affordability of electric appliances, and so demands keeps growing. There's industry that's uh, still locating in Mexico, despite what we might hear. Um, there's still companies moving to Mexico or expanding production in Mexico. So that's triggering triggering the demand. Um, 
the you know, the question is, can the grid keep up with that demand? You know, can can yeah. can and if you can't keep up with the demand, when an industry decides to locate somewhere, if you can't provide the basic services in a reliability basis, you can provide gas, water, and electricity in a reliable, in 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 a high quality form. They're gonna leave. You know, they're gonna move somewhere else. And uh, so if Mexico starts, you know, put us putting aside insecurity, if Mexico starts developing a a reputation for not having the high quality infrastructure that this industries need, there's going to be another country that's going to that's going to take them away. So I I I believe I strongly believe that the, one of the main focuses of the government of the policy making is is to protect to the utmost that growth. You know, yeah. How what in, what investments need to be done to protect that that growth? Uh, help the governors in each state you know, secure those investments. And uh, to me, because of this lack of information. We're not sure that that's, that's going on. What we hear is that CFE wants to turn on their fuel, oil, uh, no, com open cycle, combined, uh, no, not even combined cycle, open, open cycle uh, plants, and uh, just because they want, want, them, want them used, right? They, 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 want, they want to inject that power. Well, that's going to create a change in the marginal cost of production, and that's going to raise prices, and no company is going to, no industry is going to want to relocate to a, uh, you know, a region that has higher electricity prices on a wholesale level. Um, so anyway, so I, I think the, the t to answer your question, it's coming from both industrial and the, and the just the general demographic growth, Duncan, particularly in certain regions. On the north, uh, it's probably more acute. The growth is more acute than, than regions in the south. Uh, and ironically, the south is the one that has the least infrastructure. And that's why, you know, there's so much focus uh, from Andres Manuel from the president Lopez Obrador into into building the infrastructure to the south. No? And um, okay, I mean, I, and you hit upon another question which I which I wanted to bring up, which is of course the uh, the price of electricity in Mexico, or the cost of electricity for in particular for industry. Remember, if we go back six years, it was one of the big debates. I think it was Tanya earlier on who talked about the um, the shortages of supply of natural gas, but it was also the question that electricity was simply so expensive for industrial uh, consumers in the country. And we've seen that price come down significantly over the past six years. Um, is that part of the, uh, uh, the, the conversation that you have with the government when you talk about you know, opening up opportunities for the private sector? Because Mexico's economic competitiveness, its investment profile, et cetera, as you said, depends upon having cheap, uh, reliable electricity. That, uh, that, Duncan, I think the success of any any company in, in the power sector, or in the in, particularly in the power sector in Mexico, is going to have to be predicated around how can we help the government reduce electricity costs. Mm -hmm. If you come out and say, "Well, I'm going to build this project because it's a fantastic return opportunity," you know, we're going to you know make 15% IRRs and whatnot. I think you're going to get the door shut on you. If you you know spin that around and say, well, I'm going to invest in this plan that's going to reduce congestion or is going to inject very low low cost energy to the system, and yes, I'm entitled to make some returns, but you know they're not uh, you know, obnoxious returns. But you, Mr. Government, are going going to benefit from having access to lower cost electricity, reliable and low cost electricity. I think that that probably s carries a lot a lot. A lot of weight. Um, the reason why, and, and I wanted to add this when I heard, uh, I think it was Lisa in the morning, um, mentioned the, uh, the, you know, the uh, uh, movement against or the perception that AMLO is against renewals. So the government is against renewals. I don't have enough information to assert assert that, but they did cancel the subastas, and the reason apparently why they canceled the subastas is because they don't like renewals. Well, the real reason, as I was told last week, is that renewables, injecting renewables in, the, in a system such as Mexico in a grid that's technically not built to absorb that many renewables is going to generate additional investments that CFE cannot even uh, you know, take care of. Now, they need uh, devices to balance when voltages go down, when renewables stop, you know, wind stops blowing, and a bunch of other things that grids need uh, to just basically absorb the impact when the sun stops shining and when the wind stops blowing. And um, if you ask here, some utilities here in the U.S. don't like renewals because of that, not because they don't like the clean aspect of them, but because they create so much havoc in their system. And uh, 
and that implies investments. And every utility likes to invest money. It's just who's going to pay for those investments, and typically it's rate payers. And regulators in the states don't like utilities raising rates. Mm-hmm. Well, the same applies in Mexico. You know? Yes, the Oaxaca project wasn't going to cost the government a single penny, but rate payers were going to absorb that cost. And, and that no politician, particularly in Mexico today, wants to raise rates. Yeah. Um, so I think the solution is, I mean, the, the, the matter has to be poised as, a, as how can I help you solve? And I'm stealing a bit from a conversation, uh, a chat you gave us on the U.S.-Mexico Energy Business Council a couple of, a couple of weeks ago, or maybe a month ago, and uh, where you, you know, you know, aptly said, you know, it has to be wrapped in the Mexican flag <laughs> and, and presented as a solution. How can we help you, Mr. Government, solve your problems? And um, so that's, that, that therein lies the... It's interesting. The I mean, I, I remember a few years ago, actually, at the La Jolla event, um, we, there was uh, somebody from the California ISO there who was talking about the problem of adding all of these solar roofs to the, to the system in California, that it was causing real problems in, in, in managing the supply um, in the system. And then a year later, the same guy was back. And I'd been quoting him on this throughout the year. And I said, so what happened with all that? And he said, we solved it. Mm-hmm. And it was, it was a technological software solution. But within 12 months, mm-hmm. they'd come up with, they'd identified the problem, they'd come up with a solution. Mm-hmm. And that's the thing is if you do, if you are open to these uh, kind of collaborations with the private sector, you can actually uh, overcome these uh, seemingly insurmountable problems. Now, Merlin, I want to turn to questions of regulation. Yeah. Um, uh, Jeremy this morning talked about uh, attacks on the on the CRE. Um, we uh, we know that uh, there has been an exodus of uh, of commissioners from uh, some of the regulatory organs. Um, there have been you know questions about whether or not they're going to be truly autonomous or independent anymore. Uh, can you talk to us about that? Why that matters for the industry? Thank you for bringing that up. Actually. Um, We've been uh, actually public ab- about this uh, before in, in two previous occasions. One was back in uh, October last year when there was this uh, reform that they wanted to do to the law where they wanted to remove the autonomy for the regulators. Uh, for that, uh, for us, uh, we believe in the autonomy of the regulators. We believe in checks and balances within the energy system in Mexico. It's important, I mean, the bar that the CNH has raised in terms of transparency, in terms of uh, setting the, uh, the level playing field, in terms of guidelines, you name it, that's important to drive investment. Without it, I would doubt any of the uh, companies that we represent will be there. No? It, it just gives uh, certainty to the investor no? in, in general. So uh, we want to support the regulators. We want to, uh, uh, to continue talking with them. We want to uh, foster that conversation. Of course, there's, uh, I mean, let, let's remember the industry is, is still in its infancy and there's rough edges around some of the policies through the implementation. Uh, and we want to work with the regulators on that. But the, the main message that we want to say is we want to support them as well. They've been critical for uh, for the investments to be able to uh, land within Mexico, and we are sure that they'll be critical throughout the life of the projects. No, um, yeah, no, our full support to the regulators for sure. It, I mean, I, I remember when the system was really being uh, built uh, post 2013, 2014, and there were so many concerns about whether regulation of the energy sector in Mexico would be uh, sort of helping the market or whether it would be trying to hold the market back. And I think that uh, that conversation, it was a, it was, it was a controversial con- conversation in Mexico for a long time. But I would say that the pro-market forces people won ultimately. And I'm not saying that Mexican regulators are perfect by any stretch of the imagination. But there is an overall attitude right now amongst Mexican uh, regulatory uh, organisms that they're trying to help the market to work better correct, correct. rather than let's stop the market. Well, it's, it's less prohibitive, more um, facilitating the market. Um, how, what can you guys do from the MXE to try to make sure that that continues? Yeah, so before I answer that, uh, I couldn't agree more in terms of the proactivity of uh, uh, streamlining the whole process. No, There was an audit done by the uh, OCDE uh, throughout the previous years, which landed into a report last year with some guidelines and recommendations, and they have been 
uh, applying those uh, throughout in, in the sense that uh, today we're talking about uh, how do they share uh, data amongst themselves. If I enroll within, if I, I mean company, enroll within one of the regulators, can I be able to share information? Mm -hmm. How am I going to simplify the, just the printing process, no? Uh, and then and whatnot, it goes on and on and on. But they, they have been uh, very uh, receptive towards that feedback. Now, how does Amexi uh, incorporate uh, in, into the, uh, all of this? Uh, you know, every, before the, any of the regulators publishes a guideline, a you name it, a, a secondary law or not secondary law, but uh, any of the regulations, uh, they normally we have this conversation with them where they would they, where they would knock on our doors and they would ask for feedback. You know, what do you believe about this? And normally we would also have uh, some of the experts within the companies that are either here in the states or somewhere else in the world come and fly and give them different perspectives. No, the idea is to uh, have world class standards within Mexico. And on that note, uh, the conversation has also been um, fluid. Uh, going back to the word uh, throughout, and now, uh, now that the that the policymakers have had to reduce their staff uh, from their side, I must say they're doubling down in terms of uh, having the collaboration with us. No, uh, of course, uh, CNH from one side is working in, with the guidelines to simplify the whole uh, development plan process, which takes almost uh, six months to to get an approval. Uh, similar to that, uh, the ASA is working on their side, and we're happy to work uh, with them throughout. Mm -hmm. I must say, uh, all of all of our interaction has always been on a positive end. It takes time, of course. Uh, you you can change uh, overnight, uh, but they have taken proactively by saying, "Okay, we're going to cut down on personnel. We should also either we streamline or we just become a big bottleneck for the industry." Is that that's not what we want? No, that's not what anybody wants. No. Absolutely. I, I'd like to ask uh, Enrique your your opinion on this on the regulatory um, landscape in in Mexico right now. Um, but I'd also like to throw in we, we've talked a lot about ASEA, CRE, CNH. Um, uh, we we talked about CENASE and CENAGAS. But one organisation that hasn't come up yet is of course the COFESE, yeah. and the COFESE is fundamentally important, in particular in the uh, the first the last panel before lunch when we we're talking about you know who's going to control the CFEs, who's going to control Pemex in you know as dominant actors. Well. In large part, that is the role of the COFESE, to try to make sure that there isn't uh, uh, monopolistic or oligopolistic behavior. So I, I, I always think it's worth giving them a shout out in, on, on, on at, at these forums because they're an important actor in the energy sector that most people don't think about a lot of the time. But Enrique, tell us about uh, sort of the regulatory landscape from the point of view of the electricity sector. Yeah, the uh, electricity side, uh, Mexico. I think Mexico did the right thing, and they they copied what worked best outside, uh, you know, outside Mexico. Basically, uh, they copied a lot of the regulator regulatory frameworks uh, and uh, and market rules that operate that help operate systems here, like PJM, um, uh, ERCOT in Texas and uh, in, in Caliso. and they adjusted those and they they took the best of those and and adjusted those to Mexico. So. The market participants, particularly those that are already exposed or have been exposed to operating those markets, feel comfortable with the, you know, the majority of, of the market structure and the, and the construct and the regulatory uh, rules. Uh, perhaps the concerns have been more uh, focused on you know, the uh, this low pace at which Senase, who, who is the market operator. Is, is basically opening up the market. And uh, that's probably for obvious reasons of Senase being risk averse by nature. They didn't wanna uh, be overly too uh, you know, sympathetic or, or too you know, uh, you know, catering too much to the, to the wholesalers. And uh, so they took a more risk averse position. But I think overall this structure works. There's still some fine tuning to do. For instance, in the case of uh, importation of electricity from the U.S. Or, or Guatemala, in this case, but there's really none import from Guatemala. Mexico would import electricity from the U.S. through the existing ties that they have in California and Texas. And, um, and but but the rules when they were passed, that part of the reform, did not foster the importation of electricity per se. No, they actually hindered the importation of electricity. And it is just language in the rules that basically said if 
if uh, a power plant is located in the in the U.S. and wants to sell electricity into Mexico uh, as part of the auctions, the capacity auctions, basically, uh, uh, you you have to be directly interconnected to the Mexican system. You cannot be interconnected to the, uh, in a system to system tie, which is what ERCON and Mexico have. So that uh, no, the, the, and you ask the question why 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 would you limit the system to system interconnections? in such a way, and basically the, re the reply by, by Senasi and, and, and the former uh, you know, uh, president of the CRE was that they uh, didn't know if the systems were going to allow the imp exporting of electricity during peak times, for instance. So if Mexico was counting on that electricity for Mexican peak times, for, for when the system needed more the electricity, they didn't know if uh, across the border they were going to have constraints, and they would say, well, thou shall not export to Mexico because we have constraints here. And so they didn't want to allow those entities bidding in the Mexican auctions because they would then count them as firm, and in the hours of need, they might not be there. So they said, let's ex exclude them. Um, I, you know, we got in involved in, in uh, I would say, quote-unquote, lobbying, with, uh, mostly with Senase by, by you're selling that, that that's not going to happen. If there's a contract, it's probably not going to happen. Now, it, turn turn the you know the the the, the, uh, the, uh, the the vantage point. If you were exporting to the U.S. and Senasi was having a hard time keeping up with with, with the demand, what is the first load you're going to curtail? Well, the first load they're going to curtail is the export. So that's natural, but that doesn't mean that you cannot uh, count as firm a resource and the other resource and. Anyway, long story short, uh, we, 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 are, we are just a, you know, one of many that are helping and interacting with Senase through the different committees they set up. They set up committees, uh, operating committees, so that they gather the industry, industry feedback so that they can improve the market rules and they can improve, improve the regulations, which is something that they took after you know, PJM and ERCA. And uh, I'm not that familiar how it works with the CNH, and uh, but in, but in the electricity side, I think it's it, the mechanisms are there. It's just the will to continue operating through those uh, mechanisms. Uh, I'm not sure there's still there. You know, after the transition, I think the momentum was lost a bit. Um, so it, I think the industry and the associations have to continue pushing forward so that that momentum is not lost. Uh, eventually, it gets fed to to the COFEMER and then COFEMER. Uh, you know, basically evaluates the yes. evaluates the whole thing, but 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 the source of those changes comes from within the industry through Senasi's interaction and, and the Christ participation. Enrique, you just brought up the uh, U.S. Mexico energy trade, um, so let's go there right now. Um, Ten years ago, there was around I think a, a nine billion dollar surplus for Mexico in the bilateral energy trade because it was all of the crude oil that was going north. Um, Today, the United States, I think, has a $12 billion surplus, <coughs> something in that range, uh, in the energy trade with Mexico. That's as a result of exports of natural gas and of refined products and declining exports of crude from Mexico. Um, you are part of the U.S.-Mexico uh, Energy Business Council. Um, uh, Leslie Wilson is here in the audience somewhere, or she was anyway, um, who, uh, who helps to coordinate all of that. How is that going right now? Um, yeah, what is it that we're seeing on the bilateral level from the point of view of the, of the business community? Um, again, is it, is it a pause? Is it, are, you know, are you seeing that overall people are willing to keep driving through the fog? Uh, so, so the perspective uh, de depends which, uh, I would say, depends, de depends which person you ask that's participating in the U.S. Mexico Ener Energy Business Council. From the industry perspective, it's business as usual. Mm -hmm. uh, let's keep let's keep you know pushing forward. Let's keep amending the things that need to be amended or improved. The things that need to get, uh, get improved. Uh, some of the the participants in the U.S. side have operations and have had a history of operating in Mexico. You have the likes of you know Baker Hughes and and Exxon Mobil uh, in the U.S. side. Sempra in the U.S. side, which has Yenova on the Mexico side. And then on the Mexico side, you have Yenova participating in the U.S.-Mexico Energy Business Council. You have Cemex, cement company, Alpha, and so on and so forth. Uh, so transnational companies basically on both sides, uh, some of them indistinguishably between being Mexican or American. And uh, so that, that's helped a lot. You know, that's helped uh, both uh, the industry to communicate and have a healthy dialogue. I mean, there's alignment of interest, I would say. Mm -hmm. 
and uh, everybody wants to have cheaper energy, reliable energy, abundant energy, and, uh, and, uh, and investment certainty, basically. Uh, from the government perspective, I think the situation changed a bit because of the transition. So you had, you have U.S. Department of Commerce on this side, you have Department of Energy on this side, and and, and the staff that's managing, managing the the program, and you had commerce or economia in Mexico and in scenario in Mexico, and that the staff that managed the program left. There's no one left on either economia or commerce uh, in uh, scenario that was participating in the U.S.-Mexico Energy Business Council. So rebuilding that team has taken, taken you know, some time. You know, and, and the Economia has already named uh, uh, staff under Luz Maria, uh, under Secretary for International uh, and Economia, International Commerce. Uh, and she's sort of taking the lead on the, on the, on the uh, Mexico side. Sener hasn't named anyone yet that I know of that's going to participate in the in as liaison on 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 this this event, and it again comes back to the circles of trust and the uh, the syndrome of I don't know what I don't know. So if I don't know what I don't know, I might not want to participate. <laughs> and uh, so the role that I think industry has that harness brokers uh, you know, like the Wilson Center and the Institute of Americas have in educating. Sener and Economia and other other entities out there of the importance of keeping that this dialogue and these institutions as a source of knowledge, a source of contacts. You know, if, I mean, there's there's no doubt that Sener needs to rebuild the the bridges that were lost whenever it left that they had built here in the U.S. with institutions, with government, with with think tanks. A lot of that is gone. So, so I think altogether, you know, between government and pr private industry helping build those bridges is going to be important. And I think the U.S. Uh, side probably has a higher burden because mm -hmm. Mexico is going to have to fight the perception that private industry is sort of in the doghouse right now yeah. <laughs> in Mexico. And then the other actors, as I mentioned, they're gone. So I think the burden falls on, on the U.S. side. Uh, and is there, uh, is there something that the U.S. government, for example, can do to try to uh, convince their Mexican counterparts that they should be participating more actively in these processes? Well, well, the little uh, I think there are already going. Uh, I mean, doing that uh, on the uh, U.S. Mexico Energy Business Council, which is the one I can speak of. Uh, there's a very healthy interaction and and, and uh, interest from commerce and and uh, energy mm -hmm. Department of Energy uh, to maintain you know, the momentum and on on this initiative uh, because the easiest would have been to just say, well, I guess you know, there's a transition. Mexico's not engaged, or let's wait until they're ready and. Uh, Let's put on pause, and that hasn't been the case. Uh, right. So I think in that in that particular data point, uh, they are they are uh, engaged and helping and and interacting, providing as much information as, as Mexico wants to receive as well. And uh, unbeknownst to me, how much Mexico is being recept receptive yes. to that uh, in, uh, dialogue. Uh, I, I think they again in economia it is because of Luz Maria's role. Senator. Mm -hmm. uh, not so much. Uh, not so much because we don't know what's... Right. I, I don't know who's... It's especially foggy over there. Yes, at especially foggy. Okay. Thank you. There you go. Um, Merlin, a, a similar question for you about sort of uh, uh, international cooperation, uh, bilateral in particular. Um, you're the direct counterpart to API. Is that, is that yeah. fair? Yes. Correct. So how, how actively do you collaborate with uh, an organization like API? Yeah. Um, for example, there was a position in Staping when the... Uh, uh, NAFTA, the second version was being negotiated, um, and yeah, it was basically stated stating with API and the Canadian Association of Petroleum Producers uh, what we believe was the best uh, way forward, and it's the same case as with that as uh, with different mechanisms we uh, do take advantage that uh, API is. Uh, much more mature uh, in many of the, the different sectors in terms of regulations, in terms of norms, in terms of uh, you name it. So we do rely on them. Uh, we, we do have a healthy chat with them. I, I was actually meant to uh, a visit one of uh, the API leaders here in Washington uh, during this visit. Unfortunately, that didn't happen because of last minute changes. But uh, we do talk uh, uh, quite frequently with them in different sorts of issues. No? Excellent. Well, we've got about 20 minutes left for questions, so uh, who would like to be, uh, to, to jump in here? So shy? Oh. Thank you so much. We've got one there and one at the front. 
Hi, I'm Kimberly Ballou from the U.S. Department of Energy. It's not really a question, but just a comment on, um, and as Enrique was just saying, on the U.S. Mexico Energy Business Council. So I'm actually Leslie's counterpart at the Energy Department. And I can say for the government perspective, um, in addition to engaging with them weekly, we've been having regular calls. Um, my team just went down there last week to try to have in-person meetings. And as it's been said all day, Sener, um has been pretty much very difficult to get a hold of. Our secretary did have a call with Rocio Nale last month and expressed interest in continuing our engagement through the council. So hopefully in the coming weeks we'll have more news. So it's on their radar, but the colleagues that we had in the past you know, a few months are all gone, as he said. And so, but we're not you know, losing hope. We're gonna stick to it. So <laughs> just wanted you to know, we're on it on the government side. Thank, Thank you, you. That's, a, that's some useful texture there. Uh, Jeremy. I'd like to get Enrique's feedback on something that's been bandied about and was talked about in the event we had last week. So you rightly pointed out this very interesting uh, I issue in Mexico of GDP growth, GDP growth being a certain number, but then power demand growth continually being twice, three times as much. And now we have some you know, shifting of, of, of ways of attending to that demand. So one of the ideas that, that's been kicked around, I'd like your, your thoughts on, is the idea of creating a subasta that's a private to private. So a, a private sector developed, managed, and in, 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 in carried forth uh, auction process. So where you have like Semex, who was participating in the last auction in Mexico, being an off taker, and then having an auction process where a host of companies, yours and others, could participate in bidding to supply Semex or other qualified mm -hmm. uh, buyers with power. So in other words, an auction, a new auction in Mexico, but not one launched by the government, but rather one launched by the private sector. Well, that's an intriguing, intriguing concept uh, because it's true that, that you know, some of that generation that, that, that exists in Mexico is built and operated and owned some of that by these you know, Semexes of the world, the Alphas, although some of them have been divesting those assets. And, uh, and I, if, you know, they, they were built for the purpose of, of supplying their own power needs. And again, some of those plants were either over-designed and they have extra capacity that they can, you know, if I were the owners of those plants, I might want to monetize part of that capacity instead of just sitting on top of that investment. Uh, so it's an intriguing concept. And I think, uh, I, th I, I don't know how deep the, the market would be in that respect, no private to private, uh, because the fact, you know, the, the 800 pound gorilla CFE still owns the majority of the capacity directly by direct ownership or through the IPP, you know, the, uh, the programs, uh, they own, they own the, the, the contracts. And you, they might not own the assets, but they own, they own the rights to that capacity. So the question is, you know, how much capacity is there available that that's not been yet committed or, 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 or contracted? Uh, and I, I, I don't have an answer to that, Jeremy, but I think the concept is intriguing and that, that, might, that might help generate a secondary market and uh, might optimize may, may some of the fleet but it might be more beneficial between private and private owners rather than just a system system owner. And the other thing is congestion. You know, how, you know, okay, you have capacity here and the rules uh, it are the same rules that apply to the other market, uh, apply to this, uh, let's say, sub-market. And, and I don't know if that, that, that's encompassed within the same rule, but it's, it is intriguing, actually. I, I, think, I think it has it's room, room to grow. <laughs> Thank you. Any more questions from the audience? Hi, Duncan. Uh, hi. Thank you so much for the invitation to come to this meeting. Uh, my name is Christina Fry. I'm the Vice President of the Mexican American Civic Association in Washington, D.C. And um, I've been listening to uh, all the panelists, great information, but there is a historical context to all this. 100 years ago, Mexico had a revolution and um, 20% of the population in Mexico, uh, out of the 20% of the pop uh, 20 million population in Mexico, three millions were able to read and write just 100 years ago. The other ones were pedestrians. Uh, with the oil, with Pemex, with the um, expropriation of the oil industry, Mexico was able to create the public education system, a health system, uh, housing, and a lot of institutions that make our uh, 17 million pedestrians who were wearing no shoes and were called the pyjama by the um, American Ambassador Wilson, the pyjama wearers. Um, 
we were, that's why we adore our oil, because it's part of our inheritance. It's very important for us. And in our 12K education, we are told that oil is our property. That's why the 120 millions of Mexicans, when we hear that American companies are going to come and take over our oil, our electricity, our resources, we are very suspicious. Because in the past century, they weren't good to us. And Americans are well known for coming, taking over, digging the gold, destroying, taking all the monies, and leaving the country. That's the history. We, the, we have a history behind. And it's not an, a good one. And now you want to build a border. What do you think 120 million Mexicans think about it? Are we happy about that? No. Are we going to let you take our companies, our oil, our resources? We're not happy about that. I don't want, I don't think I want my kids losing that kind of... Would you be happy with Chinese or British or Belgians or No, I, I'm happy about Mexicans developing their own industries. So you want, you want to have a nationalist uh, perspective here? Yeah. Yeah, Mexicans are capable. Right. We have Exatex here. We have ITESM. We have universities. We need to develop our own industries. We need to make our people stand up and fight for our own resources. So on, on that note, if I, I might add, uh, we are uh, today I represent uh, the uh, the, organ the companies, uh, in but uh, a few months ago I represented the uh, the energy ministry, and in no way have I changed my perspective in terms of uh, sovereignty of the mineral rights, and what I'm trying to say here is uh, it, it, the law is clear that uh, whoever. Uh, leases and wins uh, an auction uh, to develop those rights, it is the extraction rights that you win. You don't win the rights of that oil below. And that there's that line is, is extremely well documented through the contracts, through the law, uh, everywhere. In reality, what we are uh, doing here is uh, complementing Pemex capacities. Pemex has had a, uh, an enormous success in shallow waters specifically. What we're trying to say here is that, uh, okay, there's different companies with expertise in deep water, there's unconventional, there's, as I mentioned before, different risk appetites that uh, we could all help towards the same goal. And it can be Mexicans as well, no? No, it's I agree with that. If you companies are coming with a social responsible concept, uh, we, I mean, if you spread that word, we are going to be happy with that. Yeah. But don't destroy our country, don't uh, destroy Absolutely. our resources, Absolutely. just take the gold out, like the Spanish, like the, uh, I mean, we have oh, a I history agree. of conquerors coming and taking from us. I, I fully That's agree the history with that. we have. And we need to work with the community. And, and all the, the businesses, business owners and the corporations should understand that. For us, oil is part of our blood. And we're going to fight I, I find for it. this. I find this a fascinating part of the conversation because, to a foreigner, to somebody from Britain, oil is just oil. It's no. it's 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 a commodity. It's something that you you use for energy. It's just like turning on the light switch. Is like I don't care where that electron came from. I just want the light to come on. When I open the fridge, I want there to be a light on in there. That's all I'm interested in. But for Mexicans, and uh, it's fine. No, I mean I, I've heard this time and time again, and it's fascinating, and it's very difficult. I think for us to truly grasp it. We can say we understand, we can say that we know that you believe those things, but do we really feel it? Feel it? No, of course we don't. It, and it, it's, it's very difficult. So I'm, I'm very grateful to you for bringing that up. Um, I'd like to, uh, to pose a, a fun question at the end of this panel. So um, let's just say that uh, the Secretary of Energy um, says, I've just seen this panel at the Wilson Center. These two dudes were amazing. I, I, I'd like to switch out my undersecretaries. So uh, this Marrakin guy, I'd like him to be the Undersecretary of Electricity. And, and Merlin, El Mago, I want him to be my, uh, my, my Undersecretary of Hydrocarbons. What are the top three to five things that you would advise the Secretary of Energy to do? You want to start? <laughs> Thank you. El Mago leading the way here. Uh, no, actually, it goes uh, line in line with what we're advising today with the National Development Plan. And the first one is, of course, certainty. And certainty is easy to be said. Uh, how are you going to actually uh, implement it? 
And the law is clear in terms of having uh, today a five-year plan, no? It's, uh, it's a mechanism, it's similar to different countries where it lays out a vision of where you want to take uh, the, in our case, the upstream sector. So today uh, there's one, it actually finishes this year. So what we would request is for them to lay out their vision through a newly developed uh, five-year plan. Basically, uh, that also uh, sets the table for uh, yearly bidding rounds. So uh, within the five-year plan, you would see, okay, uh, it's only indicative. It doesn't mean that it's, uh, uh, you know, they, they will have to stick uh, to word by word by everything it says. But basically, you know, we want to develop this sort of sector. These are the type of blocks that we want to bid out. And uh, that would set the ground for future investments, you no? Know? Uh, companies that are there, not everybody want uh, 11 blocks like Shell. There's uh, companies that want just one block, and then uh, they're taking that only uh, as uh, you know. How am I gonna invest in, in Mexico in the future if the opportunities are limited? No, uh, that's part of what we're seeing. Uh, 2019, uh, it's it's a year of consolidation without uh, no bidding blocks. I mean, the amount of players there will either take a uh, a decision whether they want to either develop their their field or they want to merge or, or they want to do that no so if we want to open the door to, uh, for different players we need to give uh, certainty in the future so that's uh, that's one the other and um, you know we do want to mention it it's uh, unconventionals uh, unconventionals as everybody knows they hold the the majority of the prospective resources uh, in Mexico and there's a huge on-tap uh, potential there, no? And the regulation is ready. Uh, it, it is quite uh, restrictive, I must say. Uh, but, uh, it, it, well, it doesn't matter if it's super restrictive or not. What we want is to give certainty, I mean, what, to the uh, uh, society in general that what we're doing is uh, we're doing the right thing. So we need to break momentum here. And, and prove that, and, and the only way to do that is uh, to actually drilling and, and applying what's what's in the law. So that's uh, uh, the second thing I would say. And yeah, um, the last one, there are mechanisms uh, for Pemex to increase their uh, potential in terms of production, in terms of uh, reserves and everything that they are worried about with the current uh, rating agencies. Uh, and their uh, forecast, uh, their current forecast. So on that note, it has been proven mm -hmm. uh, that the farm outs uh, do work, that uh, working in unison with different companies who can provide the capital, who can provide the expertise, it, it works, no? So we would uh, be very happy to work with the current administration and, and tell them, uh, Let's look at what has happened before. Let's look at the capacity that Pemex has. We want to grow that capacity uh, by incorporating different expertise. And there's companies that we represent through Mexi that are already doing that, no? So it would make sense uh, in, in, order to, uh, in order for Pemex to diversify their risk, to continue working in unison with different companies. And it's just industry standard no it's been done here in the northern side of the gulf of mexico it's been done all over the world no um i guess those are the three points that we would advise no? thank you merlin enrique thank you um i would um i would first uh focus on our act you know all the actions uh, on uh, getting the projects and the investments that are already underway done as soon as possible because typically those investments in the case of electricity are going to be either a new generation or new transmission projects or, or things that are going to improve the grid. They're not, up, they're, they're not speculative investments. I mean, there might be some speculative investments, but there's very few. I only know of one merchant project in Mexico right now, one merchant power, 100% merchant power plant in Mexico. The rest typically have a purpose and need. So focus on that, get them out as soon as possible. In parallel, we can work on new policies and we can work on new mechanisms and we can work on, on what have you. But right now, get get those done as soon as possible because losing that momentum could could kill a project. And in uh, some of those projects, regardless of how much money they have invested in, uh, and assuming they've complied with all the social, you know, all the social uh, interaction and, and and they're you know they're they're good for the communities as well and for the environment, 
they should be good for the system. So get, get those done as soon as possible and, and exclude them from all the, you know, the politics and the oversight that's going on right now. They're, they're looking at every, they're opening the hood of every single car they have in the parking lot. And I think some of those don't need to be opened up. Um, the second one is uh, I would uh, engage in with our trusted counterparties. So I would pick who are the tr honest brokers or the trusted counterparties and engage with them as soon as possible and, y and use those relationships to build up that expertise as soon as possible <laughs> that was lost, no, that, w that was uh, let go. And, and to her point, uh, to the lady's point, uh, you know, you know, educate the new talent. Now, the new people are occupying all these new positions. Educate them as soon as possible, right? Rather than, I mean, they can go to the university and, and go through the, uh, you know, the typical cycle, or they can be pragmatically educated through, through again, honest brokers and, and engagement with uh, experts outside, outside the country or inside the country. You know, it doesn't have to be foreigners. And the third is, uh, it probably falls along the, the first point, is I would revamp, I would put all the energies in the public-private partnership model that was abandoned. You know, the, that, that, that was tooted as the next big thing and then was abandoned and CFE has yet to enter a, a PPP. And, uh, and I think there's, there, you, you, you'll be surprised how many people will invest in electricity under a PPP program, uh, ourselves included. Uh, you know, making the government your partner is probably the best thing for the for the project. <laughs> it, it's a natural hedge. You know, in case that something goes wrong, you have the government as your partner, so maybe you won't be as affected as as if you weren't. You no, know, partner with the, with the government. It brings the transfer of technology to to the utility. Obviously, it alleviates the need for the government to invest money in the project, and uh, it aligns interests quite nicely. Uh, it educates the utility as well on how to run or govern you no know, entities or investments in a different way, and they can decide whether they adopt those to govern their, themselves or not internally. And, uh, but PPPs, I think, could be and similar to farm outs, as uh, Dr. Moreira was saying. You know, farm outs are still you know, the, the big question mark in that big bulge you know, that, that he showed that as the uh, assignation is the round zero. Well, the same here for CFE. You know, PPPs could be the, the way that CFE can get out of the uh, CapEx uh, quandary that they're in right now. Well, keep checking your email, see if that uh, invitation uh, arrives from Senair. Um, but uh, I would, uh, I'd like to thank you both for, uh, for spending the time with us and, uh, and for sharing your thoughts. Um, please stay around because we're going to have uh, our, our final uh, keynote address from uh, Luis Vera right now. But uh, gentlemen, thanks very much. Thank you. Muy well. So, to wrap up our uh, event today, uh, we're delighted to have with us Luis Vera Morales, who is the Executive Director of the ASEA, the Agencia Nacional de Seguridad Industrial y Protección al Ambiente del Sector Hidrocarburos uh, in, in la Ciudad de México. Prior to this, he was an Associate Director at Vera and Asociados, a law firm specialized in social environmental law in Mexico and other countries of Latin America. He was also a Director at Vera and Carva Carvajal, an Associate in Chief at Vera, Borget and Celis. His extensive experience in environmental law in and out of government institutions, as he has been an Associate Lawyer and a Department Head as well at the Secretariat of, uh, of Tourism. Um, he holds a Bachelor's Degree in Law from the Escuela Libre de Recho in Mexico, a Master's Degree in Energy Environment uh, from Tulane. Uh, additionally, he holds a PhD in Environmental Science and Sustainable Development from the Interdisciplinary Center for Research and Studies on Environment and Development of the National Polytechnic Institute in Mexico, the IPN. Welcome, Dr. Vera. Thank you so much. Hi, how are you? Thank you for staying with us. Uh, it is, uh, you know, a hard time also, but uh, let's, let's uh, go with it. Uh, well, thanks so much for, for the Wilson Institute. Uh, thank you for the invitation. 
it's uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, uh, you know, you have heard I have been the, the last 30 years working on uh, private sector. So when the the uh, minister invited me, it was uh, it was it was a good thing for me because it was a time to prove that we could do the things as we say we do it in the private sector, which is more efficiently and uh, transparent and uh, try to do a different thing. So um, I accepted. I, I had to, mine is a is a presidential position, so I had to go with the president and convince him why. Uh, really, the, the I say I needed a lawyer rather than a, than a, uh, an engineer. Uh, it was hard. Uh, the minister of uh, uh, of uh, energy uh, thinks that. Uh, this uh, a position for an engineer, and I understand perfectly the situation and the position. Uh, however, we think, uh, and I mean the, uh, the uh, environmental minister and I, that this is a good time to, um, you know, go after the legality of all these uh, contracts, uh, permits, etc. So, uh, with that said, um, just to just to let you know, um, what do we do? We control, and we are almost alone in this throughout the world, uh, uh, in controlling the entire uh, uh, chain value of the, of the uh, hydrocarbons uh, uh, activities. We do um, regulate, authorize, and supervise the exploration, the drilling, the production, the industrial transformation, the transformation, the transportation, storage, and all downstream. Not only the the uh, uh, distribution and retail, but now we are about to be uh, authorizing also what Walmart sells uh, of hydrocarbons in the you know the little uh, you know containers. Um, we are talking about approximately uh, now uh, 45,000 uh, uh, regulated uh, members of the regulated community, but in this year. We're going to end up uh, in around 60,000 because we are expecting 15,000 more uh, 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 gas stations to be uh, applying for authorizations. So um, uh, it is a, a huge task. We are only 400 people. Um, so we, as, as you might think uh, and you would expect, we are relying heavily on, uh, on uh, technological tools. We don't have delegations. Even though we have uh, throughout the 32 uh, uh, states, we we have a, a related community, with related members, so it's a it's a huge uh, 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 task in front in front of us. So we and and also the scope of what we do is uh, we uh, provide we, we the, the scope of our our mandate is industrial safety, operational safety, and environmental protection. Um, just on Friday, um, we uh, celebrated our fourth uh, anniversary. Right now in Mexico City is the, the ASEA week. So uh, we have a, a lot of people from the U.S., from Canada, uh, um, from England, from Colombia. From, you know, we have a, a bunch of Im uh, uh, invited personalities. I should be there, but really I, I, I wanted to be here and with my, my good friends. And um, uh, but uh, the important thing is that it's the most uh, um, recent agency for the Mexican government. It's uh, totally different from what, what is there right now. We are self-sufficient in the in the, in that we don't cost the government. Actually, we have a fantastic surplus. We do uh, work with uh, the fees that are paid by. The companies, for example, this year we had uh, uh, 2018, uh, we had a surplus of uh, approximately 98 million pesos, which really is a lot for this kind of agency. But this year we're going to be about 900 million pesos in surplus. So uh, uh, we can do a lot of things with that money because it, the, it comes from our own trust. It's, a, it's a, a, a constitutional trust, so it cannot be taken away from us. So, uh, of course, we're, we're very much uh, oversighted uh, by uh, the Ministry of Treasury. You know? So we, we need to, to, f to, to, to uh, uh, put that money into environmental uh, uh, programs that have to do with hydrocarbons industry. 
So, uh, you know, anyway, it's, it's, it's a fantastic uh, uh, agency if you see it in that way. So uh, here you can see how we relate with, with others, and uh, including BC and BOM, and um, none of these uh, uh, entities do all, all the value chain, only us. And uh, of course, if you see our, our very uh, uh, affected, uh, how do you say, presupuesto, our budget. budget, you will see that we're trying to, to do uh, less and, uh, well, more and more and more with less and less and less. We were affected by, uh, with 31% uh, of our budget only this year. So uh, that, that meant that from uh, around 500, we're now in about 380 people. So, uh, so it has affected us a lot. And we do both, industrial safety and environmental protection. You know. So what's our, our approach? Uh, we uh, try to promote safety and environmental culture in the oil and gas operations through regulation that's, that's objective-based. We are now, uh, uh, we just reviewed last uh, week, we have uh, three laws that, 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 that we are convincing the, convincing the legislative uh, a branch to change so that we are, have a better position of regulating. We have uh, several uh, uh, regulations uh, undergoing. We have um, provisions, no? uh, disposiciones generales de carácter, uh, uh, um, disposiciones de carácter genérico, um, that will, uh, that 48 of those, just uh, to regulate specific activities within the chain. And we had norms official norms, uh, all go, and, and Mexican standards also. So we have this, the whole set for the hydrocarbons industry, and we do that with, uh, 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 with our team. So uh, we are based also, uh, uh, we, we do it through risk-based management. Uh, we are, you know, we were talking yesterday about this. Um, we go to our approaches, to, to, to our inspections, with the with the regulated community, with uh, uh, based on risk, if we think that something is risky, for example, if some operation is not in accordance with whatever we see that was authorized, we can close them down. We 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 can we can actually go after them only uh, if we think there's risk. We are not so, and, and it's supposed to, for example, damage. I don't have to prove damage in order to act. So this is a very powerful tool, for example, now that we're dealing with the theft of, of, of gas or gasoline. No? So we are the ones that hold this precious uh, 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 instrument, which is uh, uh, risk-based uh, uh, um, inspections. Uh, we work in all the cases, in all the permits, with uh, incorpor the incorporation of international best practices, not only the permits, we're supposed to, and uh, we are required to uh, ask for uh, administration systems uh, that would, uh, would require you, or the, or the related community, to, to not only to uh, comply with the law, to propose this administration system, and then year by year to demonstrate us that they are following international practices and that they are improving. Every single year you have to show improvement. This is, uh, this is interesting because uh, this is in the law. And um, now we, we, one part of saying me yes to this position was that I convinced the minister that it was a good idea to do this and therefore change the way in which the environmental uh, uh, administration by the whole works. So now we change the law that has already been changed so that the Ministry of Environment is taking this view. So uh, uh, what you will see in the future is uh, environmental housing is, 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 is gone. What you will see is everybody will be uh, required to have an administration system on these uh, environmental practices and, and uh, uh, with uh, uh, um, uh, um, continuous improvement you know, in, the, in, the, in, the, in, the, um, in the regulations and in the authorizations. Um, we are also favoring preventive and corrective actions rather than the persecutory approach. We don't want really to, 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 to uh, you know, they, they have to, the companies have to comply with the law, 
but we rather go after corrective measures so that the good money goes to the correction, no, rather than to the imposition of, of fines. If at the end I need to, to find someone or, or you know put it at the stake and burn them alive, I would do that. But you know, at, after they had the chance of correcting, and uh, we have had a, a, a great, great uh, uh, response. But we are we. You know, if you if you see the, the difference between the Semenat and Profepa and ASEA, which does both things, regulate and, and supervise, you will see that we have almost 90% less litigation than Semenat and almost 100% uh, percentage more of compliance in this industry than all the other industries that Semenat regulates. It's amazing. Um, we do performance evaluation. We want to, to, to do this through third parties. So we don't have inspectors. We have around 60, 65 inspectors for the entire, uh, you know, 45,000 uh, 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 regulated uh, in, uh, uh, companies and individuals. But we do this through third parties. And so the third parties are authorized to check out for us how are the companies, uh, uh, you know, doing the compliance. And we, our inspectors, do check those third parties. So we're focusing on, you know, the third party has, you know, we have third parties that have 300 uh, uh, companies that are under, under their, their contract you know, uh, uh, to, to, for review. Uh, so we go after one of them rather than the 300. And um, um, s still this is an evolving uh, thing, but we are, we'll see the numbers uh, later on about how are we doing this, and we think we're going the right track. Uh, this is also being taken by Semanat, so uh, we are moving the entire system now with Profepa so that we have less and less inspectors and more third parties authorized. And of course, with a lot of technology, we are about to, to, to put up you know, a, a handheld or, or in, an app where the third party is going to show me, and it's going to be in months, not, not even you know, half a year, two or three months, we're going we're to have all these three uh, third parties, authorized third parties, with this app where, where one of my inspectors is going to check that the guy is there, that he's identified uh, in, the, in, the, in the app, that whatever he's seeing, we will be seeing, that whatever he takes a, a photo or we ask for a photo of a specific uh, uh, place or a video, we will see in that live. No. So, Every single check, we will, we will review that the guy is doing his, whatever he's, he's supposed to do. No? So I th uh, we, we think that this will improve uh, also the, the, um, uh, the way in which the, these third parties are, 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 are supposed to operate. It's not only a trust, but we will be able to see that. So right now, uh, we are trying to, to construct the ASEAS vision into the uh, National Development Program. Uh, or, or plan. Um, remember, we, we were just created uh, five years away. The, the ASEA was, um, the, the was four years away. So it wa there, there wasn't enough time for us to be in the, in the past national development program or plan. Now we are in the program, not in the, in the program of the Ministry of, of Natural Resources. I'm, a, I'm not an independent and autonomous regulator. I depend on, uh, on the Minister of Environment. And we are handling these three uh, uh, courses, no? the Sustainable Management of Resources for Social Wellness, Climate Change, and Water and, and Environmental Degradation. <coughs> and from there, we are building the ASEA Strategic Program, which, by the way, we already have. We're, we're really ahead of, 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 of the discussion. We have had that, this for time now, and we just uh, adjusted and tuned up it uh, uh, on the first weeks uh, of, of uh, December. What are our, uh, our uh, priority issues? Responsible production, um, linking the hydrocarbon sector to biodiversity, and this important thing, uh, up until now, for four years, the ASEA has been focused on industrial safety. You know, I, we, we had a lot of engineers only focusing on that. What we are doing now, and it shows now in all our, our, our authorizations, and even in the, in the resolutions, finding, for example, a certain company that cleared out 280 hectares of, 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 you know, of, of uh, palms and, and, and uh, mangrove, we, uh, we went after them with science. We went after them with uh, 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 evaluation of the social 
of the of the economic uh, services of the of the uh, ecosystem that they affected. So we are trying to put that you know that that environmental view in 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 the in every single uh, single one of our actions as as government. So uh, the other thing is uh, we we of course are trying to contribute to the to the. Uh, objectives of the Millennium of, of United Nations, uh, close regulatory breaches, and, I'm, and, and this is very interesting for, for, for you to know how it works. We have a, uh, uh, a planning uh, 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 unit. That planning unit see what's, what's going on and try, try to uh, identify the breaches, the gaps in the law so that every, every single gap is, is closed. So with that analysis, we go to regulation. Regulation uh, uh, works and, and try to, to, to uh, uh, close that gaps through laws, regulations, uh, provisions, and, uh, norms, and, and uh, Mexican standards. Then we go to the, to the uh, with that information, we go to the uh, Unidad de Gestión, the unit that gives out uh, the, the permits. From there, we go to the, to, the, to the guys that do the inspections, and then with the unit that see these inspections and, and, and imposes the, 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 the fines. And there's another part of this planning uh, 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 people that are there, are here, evaluating and putting this into the context of what, what was missing last year. So it's a, it's a circle. You know? So we're, we, are, we are there, I think that we are cleaning up that. And that's what we're putting in the ministry now. Um, we are trying to, to, to be very efficient, to be sure. I don't have those, those things here, but um, it, it was, all of this was a, a, a work of, of the past uh, administration. We are just trying to follow into that. Uh, you know, I, I'm not going to, to, to say it, nothing that, that, that we have done in two months. No, this, this has been a, an ongoing effort. And uh, uh, what, what is clear is that uh, a lot of people were saying that, or there was a lot of, of controversy about the agency because, of course, it was, it was slow. And it was very difficult to maintain uh, the, the whatever it was in the law, you know, authorizing uh, a, a platform in 60 days. You know, it was impossible to do that. And we had a lot of those problems, and I suffered those problems when I was on the other side. So when I arrived, I, I tried to look into that. So we have been working on making this uh, uh, more, more efficient, um, trying not to, to uh, oversee important aspects of, of each project. Now, I can tell you that we have at least in, 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 in the next month, uh, the 100 days uh, uh, program, you know, uh, uh, goals is uh, to have reduced to 3% only the delays. We are about there now. We think that in two months there will be no delays, and much of those delays had to do with the the um, uh, with this. No, our online service office we had uh, some glitches, so we lost in a week uh, in in November. You know, the past administration was still uh, uh, like three thousand uh, uh, um, submissions, no uh, applic applications. So we're trying to to bring that to, to life again, that was a problem. We were about to resolve it and, and to be again in time. When the president, for example, uh, uh, had this, this uh, uh, um, morning uh, uh, conference saying that the pipelines, that we had problems with the pipelines. I was soon summoned with the president and uh, uh, I had, uh, I had a good news, at least in, in our side, that of all the seven uh, companies with you know, maybe 120 uh, uh, um, tramos, um, sections of, of the pipelines under authorization, all of them were already authorized on the environmental side and the operational side. All of them had problems with the social issues, but not with the agency. The agency was on time of, on every single one of them. So uh, um, it, was, it, was, it was good news and it was... Uh, uh, for us, it was important to 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 be there, no. Um, so uh, um, we we are focusing on the implementation of the Sasi Sopa, the the 
administration system of operational industrial safety and environmental protection for all the 45,000 guys, all of them would need Sassisopas. Uh, we require financial in instruments, uh, uh, th and that means um, bonds and, and uh, seguros. Um, insurance. Insurance. Thank you. And, uh, of course, all of our regulation based on risk um, in every state uh, stage of the value chain, as I've, uh, I've mentioned, with this G G digital and optimized platform, which we are about to correct, and uh, with the support of these third parties. Um, we try. We are. We have been, I think, also successful in trying to establish that the companies are the ones that should bear the risk. No, we have some problems with with Pemex and uh, some legis some uh, litigation there. But uh, the rule is that uh, companies should control the risk. They can use uh, the financial instruments, the, the insurance and, and bonds, to reduce the risk, uh, to to transfer the risk, and then through the SACIOPA reduce whatever risk they have. So this is the way we are trying to, 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 uh, to do this. And um, also we are trying to coordinate better and better with CNH and, and the CRE. Uh, yes, you know, th there's no, th you know, there's no need for CRE to ask you for seven documents, five of which I, I, I would need again. So we're trying to uh, be sure that whatever it, it has already been required from CNH or CRE, is being transferred to us immediately through technological means. That would mean at least 20% of our time of, of, of evaluation. So the, it, is, it is important for us. Uh, we don't want anyone to say that the reform is not working because we are late on our, on our, on our decisions. So uh, um, this third party model is, uh, something that we are uh, look, looking at very specifically and very very closely uh, we want to we need to create a market you know we are giving thousands of authorizations based on someone that supposedly is going to check out every three months every six months and you know uh, make uh, some reports etc so we need the third parties but uh, you know we were in this moment where uh, are, are we going to give everyone a title of third parties or um, are we going to put a very high standard so it would be less we need to create a momentum so uh, uh, what we decided was to at least put a minimum of requirements to the part third party so it, a market would be created and now we are putting a little more of, of eyes on, on on that and we are strengthening the requirement for the third parties we are making sure to them that we're going to review them and that they are going to, to be subject to a high standard of performance so that uh, we will have third parties charging 5,000 pesos for a report of a, of a, of a, a gas station. No? Because you know, in that way, we cannot ensure that risk is limited no? or, or is, is, is going down. So uh, we, we have that problem. It's, it's, it's a difficult problem if you think of it. This is the... Well, we have had uh, 17 calls for approval. We have 379 approvals right now on third parties. Uh, on uh, authorizations, uh, uh, also 213 authorizations. And I want to, 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 to tell you it is because of this. We approve certify certification organisms, verifying units, the laboratories, and then we authorize third parties. Um, so uh, this is our, our panorama right now. We are on time of, on in, 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 in all of those, uh, in, in like yellow is the, the color, we are on time on the evaluation and it's a double blinded. We don't know who, uh, who's, the, who's the name, only a, a few guys in the organization knows who, who these guys are. To each of the, of the processes of authorization, we only see an, an, a number. So that tries to, to ensure that we are not you know, favoring someone in particular. And of, of course, we are trying to, to, to tune up the inspection criteria. Uh, it will be uh, 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 much better through, through this means that I was telling you. And um, uh, we have this, uh, this, uh, 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 this uh, uh, semaphore, uh, decisional. Um, the traffic light. The traffic light. Uh, 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 system, 
where uh, uh, we will have the inspection meeting, we, we, we will see which is uh, where we don't accept any risk, where there is tolerable risk, or where is acceptable the risk. No? Uh, if, if that is so, uh, we can give observations that or impose corrective actions, resolutions, uh, uh, establishing obligations, and then follow-up programs. And all of this has to do with the organizational culture. Our ASEA week uh, these days is to foster the uh, culture of, organ uh, of organization and of, of, of zero risk in the companies. It seems like it's something given, but it, it is not, not even in the, in the Mexican small companies, even with the large ones. No, we, we, had, we, we just imposed a, uh, a 160 million pesos uh, uh, to one foreign company, and, and we are about to impose like five of those, no? which is unheard of in Mexican, in, 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 in Mexican administrative law. We, we impose 2 million, 3 million pesos, 15 million pesos. Well, 160, 200 million pesos, it's completely unheard of. But we are not trembling about that. They do deserve the, the, the fine, and we are and we're imposing that. And, uh, well, this is the, uh, uh, in general, the, the regulation that we are working on now, transversal regulation. Uh, exploration and extraction, industrial processes, transport, storage, distribution, retail. We're working throughout the process, and uh, as I was telling you, our number is about 40, 40 something uh, uh, laws, regs, and, and, and norms, etc. Well, that, that is it. Um, you know, I'm open to, to questions, and uh, be sure that we're trying to do our best to, to regulate this, this activity. Thank you. Thank you so much, Luis. <laughs> do we have any questions from the audience? Nobody? Uh, I'd like to comment something, Luis, if I may. Sure. Um, we had your predecessor, Carlos de Regules, here a number of occasions. And of course, uh, you know, he helped to construct the, uh, the ideas there. What kind of continuity have you seen? I mean, from what you've shown up here on the screen, it seems as though the basic principles, the organization of the, uh, of the agency continues more or less the same. Do you yeah. think that there will be changes required by your incorporation into the National Development Plan? Or uh, would, do you see more continuity um, in the future? Well, we want the continuity. Uh, what we're doing are, are that we are trying to tune up certain aspects of that. For example, the third party, uh, it was really in a very uh, early stage of, of creation. So uh, we needed a lot of criteria. We are developing the criteria right now. Uh, also, uh, the environmental part of it. If, if you see a resolution of three months ago, for example, it was going to be a resolution mostly based on uh, industrial safety, not on environmental aspects. Now we're putting a lot of, 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 uh, of thinking, a lot of science, a lot of, of, of discussions with the National Institute of, of Climate Change, for example, with Conavio, uh, about what does it mean to, to affect an ecosystem by an hydrocarbons industry. So uh, we are working hard on that. We know uh, there was this case where uh, everybody went, uh, well, was a, an uproar about the company that cleared out some uh, some uh, 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 hectares for where the, those Bocas refineries are going to be, and uh, it was a, you know no no one believed that we would impose a, 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 a fine. A fine. Yeah. No one. I, I had ex ministers calling me saying, "Hey, are you going to impose a fine?" Yeah, you know they broke the law. Well, you're going to be the, you know, the, 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 the um, uh, funcionario, the, the, uh, the official with less time in a position because you are going to be, <laughs> Luis, you are crazy, don't do that. These guys are not going to, to, go, to go with you. And I think that there was no way to do it all the way. Um, my instruction by the, by the president was to comply with the law, and I followed that. And I followed that, you know, instead of, of giving a, a resolution of, 15, 20 pages, which is the normal, you know, we did a 150 because we didn't want anything to go wrong. We studied this, this by heart. We went to the, to the technical guys, we went the, with the scientists, we went to the, to the, to the authorities, to the local authorities. We, we, every single part of the resolution had to be perfect because it was the first one. And uh, we wanted to, to show that whoever broke, uh, breaks the law is going to be under our, our scrutiny. So that part 
has been interesting because a lot of the of the young guys in the in the in the in the agency were really happy that we that we, that we were going no and imposing something because that was our 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 uh, mandate. So it, it was it was amazing. You know, you you could see them last week. The minister went on, on Friday for, and you you could you could see how happy they were, how proud they were that we were enforcing the law, even though it was against one of the uh, pet projects of the president. But, you know, that's, that's what we're supposed to do. And I think that they were very proud, and I was proud as well of, of the people. No? They helped a lot. Luis, before um, today, I knew that the uh, independent or autonomous uh, regulatory organs were important in Mexico. Um, after hearing you speak today, um, I'm even more <laughs> convinced, and uh, I'd like to extend you an invitation to come back next year when we do another one of these events and to, to, to talk to us again about... Uh, how things have gone in the sector, um, as assuming that you know you don't find too many other people and get kicked out of your job. <laughs> yeah, but, uh, that's right. Um, but thank you very much for being with us. And ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for spending the day thank with us. Thank you so much. Thank you.